Hello. In this lesson, I'd like to tell you all you need to know about complex numbers. And hopefully, by the end of the lesson, you'll understand where complex numbers come from, you'll understand why we use them, and you'll be comfortable if people bring them up in class. If you like what I do and you'd like to support that, well then Patreon is the best place to do it. So, let's begin. The major topics I'm going to discuss in this lesson are listed in front of you. I'm going to start about where complex numbers come from, derive the Euler formula using Taylor series, talk about some useful identities, and conclude with the Euler identity, the very, very famous Euler identity. So that concludes this section, and in the next section I'm going to talk about where complex numbers come from. We are all familiar with real numbers from our daily lives. So let's consider the positive real number line. In this we have the integers such as positive 1, 2 and 3. We also have rational numbers such as a half and 3 quarters. But we also have irrational numbers such as e and pi. Now what happens when we extend the positive real number line in the negative direction? Well we're going to get negative integers such as minus 1 and minus 3. We're also going to get negative rational numbers and negative irrational numbers. Note that the building block for the real number line is the square root of plus 1, which is simply 1. So looking at our real number line, we have positive 1 times the square root of 1. We have e times the square root of 1. We have negative 2 times the square root of 1. The thing is, though, that the real number line doesn't account for or allow us to discuss the square root of a negative number. And that poses the question, what is the square root of minus 1? Well, it turns out that the real numbers we are all familiar with aren't the most general type of number. And we refer to the most general type of number as a complex number. And complex numbers have two components. A real component, so something coming from the real number line, and something we're calling imaginary numbers. And that hints at the concept of an imaginary number line. So a complex number has both real numbers and what we're calling imaginary numbers. To be clear though, although we're using this almost strange terminology imaginary, imaginary numbers are no less real in the mathematical sense. What we're calling imaginary numbers actually exist, and they're not just a mathematical construct in order for us to do mathematical manipulations. So, the square root of plus 1 is the building block for the real numbers, and the square root of negative 1 is the building block for the imaginary numbers. And once again, the terminology real and imaginary isn't very good, so unfortunately we'll have to go with it because that's what it is. We use the placeholder z for an arbitrary complex number. It has two components, a real and an imaginary component. And it's given as the square root of plus 1 times the magnitude of the real component. And it's given as the square root of negative 1 multiplied by the magnitude of the imaginary component. And we give the placeholder x for the real component and the placeholder y for the imaginary component. And the square root of plus 1 is 1, of course. So usually we actually don't explicitly write this down. We say that at z is x plus the square root of 1 times y. Excuse me, the square root of minus 1 times y. So just because in our daily lives we are most familiar with real numbers, that's not a sufficient reason to believe that only real numbers exist. There is no particular reason to think that just real numbers exist because we are used to them in our daily lives. So, I'll ask that you accept that the most general type of number is a complex number, and that it has two components, a real component and an imaginary component. That the building block for the real component is the square root of plus 1, and the building block for the imaginary component is the square root of minus 1. But that, in our daily lives, it happens that the imaginary component is usually 0, but that in science, engineering and mathematics, actually the imaginary component is very regularly non-zero. So, consider a complex number z 
whose imaginary component is zero. In other words, it has no imaginary component and z therefore is simply x, which is the real component. This of course is something which is gonna live on the real number line. So where the imaginary component y is zero, we live on a line. So by extension, when y is non-zero and x is non-zero, we are going to go from a line to a plane. We'll be living in 2D space. And very often the numbers involved in science, engineering and mathematics actually live on this infinite number plane. They don't simply live on the real number line, however they live on the complex plane. So in those circumstances, our arbitrary complex number z is given as x plus the square root of negative one times y. And the square root of negative one is so important we actually give it its own placeholder and it's the Greek letter iota. So z is x plus iota times y or x plus i times y. So we have seen that a complex number has two components and it lives in the infinite number plane. So the 2D plane used to represent the infinite numbers of, of complex numbers is actually known as an Argand diagram. As I said, when the imaginary component is zero, when the Y is zero, we are simply going to live on the real number line. Clearly, of course, the imaginary number line is perpendicular to the real number line and its building block, block excuse me, is the square root of negative one or iota. So the arbitrary complex number Z can live anywhere or exist anywhere on the infinite number plane. So if we consider this complex number here, then its X component or its real component is gonna to correspond to this section of the real number line, whereas its imaginary component is gonna to correspond to this section of the imaginary number line. In this case, X is approximately two and y is approximately 3. So z is approximately 2 plus iota times 3. Clearly we can define the angle theta here and this hints at using the Pythagoras theorem. Clearly when theta is equal to 0 then the complex number comes down onto the real number line and the complex number becomes the real number line. Conversely when theta is 90 degrees, well then our complex number actually exists only on the imaginary number line. And in science, engineering and mathematics, it is very often the case that theta is neither zero or 90 degrees or the other equivalents, and hence the complex number lives somewhere on the plane as opposed to on one of the two axes. Using the Pythagoras theorem, we can re-express the, the imaginary component and the real component using cosines and sines. So if we say that the magnitude of the complex number is a, then the real component is a cosine theta and the imaginary component is a sine theta. So whether you express your complex number in the rectangular coordinate system of x plus iota times y or in the polar system using cosines and sines is actually just down to mathematical convenience and the situation you are dealing with at the time. To be specific, we can represent the arbitrary complex number z as a its magnitude of cosine theta plus iota times sine theta or in the rectangular coordinate system of x plus iota times y. In this section we're going to talk about the Euler equation which is given in the top center of your screen. And the Euler equation is one of the most important and powerful expressions using complex numbers. It says that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i times the sine of theta. And in this section, we're gonna show that the Euler equation is true. And we're going to do that by taking a Taylor series expansion on each of the terms and showing that it is true. You may or may not know that an arbitrary function, let's say the f of z, can be expressed or decomposed into an infinite sum using an infinite power series. And this is a standard mathematical technique. For example, Fourier series are when we decompose a function into an infinite sum of cosines and sines. So specifically here, if we were to sum all of these terms to infinity, it is the equivalent of a single f of z.
So you can take it from me for the moment that this infinite power series is equivalent to our f of z, an arbitrary f of z. Note by the way that this z sub zero here is actually what's known as a pole, and really that's a divide by zero or a non-analytic scenario, which isn't important for the current circumstance at all. Simply accept that we can express or decompose a function into an infinite sum of various components. Now, one of the most used and powerful power series expansions is known as a Taylor series expansion. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a Taylor series expansion of e to the i theta, of cosine theta, and of sine theta, iota times the sine of theta, and we'll see that putting them all together, the Euler equation is true. If you'd like to know more about Taylor series, then I refer you to a video I did in my series on thermodynamics. So here are the details of the Taylor series expansion. So basically we have the same expression as we had previously, except I've plugged in the functional form for the constants or the coefficients, which are known as the a sub n's. And note by the way, the f with the n as the superscript, that is the derivative. So it's the nth derivative of our particular function. And it's evaluated at z is equal to z zero. And generally we're gonna say that we're gonna evaluate it at z or x is equal to zero. So basically all of these terms added to infinity are equivalent to our f of z. And when I take a Taylor series, I'm gonna use the nomenclature of t outside of the function to say I'm taking a Taylor series. Now in this video, I won't be going into detail and showing the Taylor series of an exponential or cosine or sine. I'll be basically giving you the results. However, I will show you all of the answers in detail subsequently. And if you want, you can pause the video then. So, as I said, we are going to show that the Euler equation is true by taking a Taylor series expansion of each of the terms in the Euler equation. And here is the definition of the Taylor series. If we take a Taylor series of e to the x, we're going to get this infinite power series. I'm going to put in the first three terms. As I said, I'll show you all of the steps subsequently. Now, if we substitute, instead of having e to the x, we have e to the i theta. Here are the first four terms in the infinite power series, or the infinite sum. I'd like that you note that some of the elements in the power series expansion are complex, excuse me, are imaginary numbers, and some of them are real numbers. And this suggests that we should group the imaginary numbers and the real numbers together. And that's what I'm getting at here. So what I've done at the bottom center of your screen is to gather the real components from the Taylor series expansion of e to the i theta and the imaginary components of that same Taylor series expansion. So the Taylor series expansion of e to the i theta has the following real components and the following imaginary components. That is to say it is a complex number. And it turns out that these terms here are the Taylor series expansion of cosine theta and these terms here are the Taylor series expansion of sine theta. Ergo or therefore the Euler equation is correct. So we have just shown that one of the most important expressions using complex numbers is true, that the Euler equation is true. And e to the i theta is cosine theta plus iota times the sine of theta. And the Euler equation is a very powerful expression to use in science, engineering, and mathematics. And very often what we do is we try and convert from cosines and sines to complex exponentials because the mathematical um, manipulation using complex exponentials is much simpler. For example, and I don't want to get bogged down in it, say you just had a single cosine of theta and you wanted to convert it to a complex exponential. Well, you could both add and subtract a complex sinusoid so you get the same thing, but you would be allowed to use the complex exponential representation. And that trick actually is used in the derivation of the Fourier transform. Anyway, I did say that I would show you all of the steps in showing that the Euler equation is true. And here they are. So if you want, you can pause the video as I show you each of the screens.
Specifically, what we're looking at here is taking the Taylor series expansion of e to the x centered at x is equal to x0, which is equal to 0. And here are all of the steps required to take the Taylor series expansions of e to the i theta, cosine theta, and sine theta. Putting those all together, then, we have the rigorous derivation of the Euler equation. So that's the end of this section. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next section. I'd like to quickly recap on the results of the previous sections. So, if we have the complex number a outside of e to the i theta, this can be re-expressed using Euler's equation as a outside of cosine theta plus iota times sine theta. Or we can say that the arbitrary complex number is given the placeholder z, and it's composed of the real component given the placeholder x, and the imaginary component given the placeholder y. We know that we can express or represent the complex number on the infinite number plane, which is known as an Argand diagram. And in doing so, we can use either the rectangular coordinates of x plus iota times y, or the polar coordinates of x is equal to a cosine theta, and y is equal to a sine theta. The next concept I'd like to introduce is that of the complex conjugate, z star. And sometimes actually it's given the placeholder z bar, but I'm going to use the star. And in order to take the complex conjugate of a complex number, you need to change the sign or the parity on the imaginary component, such that a positive iota will become a negative iota, and a negative iota will become a positive iota. I've given two examples of taking complex conjugates here. Say, for example, we have z is equal to x plus iota times y. Well, then z star, or the complex conjugate, is z minus iota times y. Also, if we have z is equal to e to the minus i theta, say, well, then z star is going to be e to the plus i theta. Now, one of the reasons people try and use the complex exponential representation of complex numbers is that it greatly simplifies mathematical manipulation. Consider we had two complex numbers, z sub 1 and z sub 2, which were both basically a outside of e to the i theta. Well then, the multiplication is going to become a, an addition operation, and division becomes a subtraction operation. And I'm sure you can see why this would make life much easier. I've listed some other useful identities and results with regard to complex numbers here, and I suggest you pause the video if you want to take them in. The most important, probably, is how to take the magnitude of a complex number by taking the square root of z and its complex conjugate. The next thing I'd like to talk about are the phases of a complex number. Recall from the unit circle the following results. We know that the cosine of zero is the cosine of twice pi is equal to plus one. And we know that the cosine of pi or 180 degrees is negative one. We know that the sine of zero is the sine of twice pi is the sine of zero. So let's plug these into our Euler equation and see what we get. The answer is very useful results, such as e to the i twice pi is equal to plus one. Or we could say that the imaginary component y is equal to zero. We know that e to the i pi is negative one, and so is e to the negative i pi equal to negative one. And this is because cosine is an even function. So putting those together, we can say that e to the plus minus i pi is negative one, which is a fairly strange looking expression. It has so many of the fundamental elements of mathematics. We can also look at the half angles of pi over 2, and we can say that e to the i pi over 2 is simply iota, and e to the minus pi i pi over 2 is minus iota. Putting those together that e to the plus minus iota times pi over 2 is plus minus iota. We can take iota to its own power, and we see that it's e to the minus pi over 2. The second last thing I'd like to talk about is periodicity. We know that a complex exponential is equivalent to a cosine 
and a imaginary sinusoid. So that means we can we should be able to use the periodicity of cosines and sines, which are twice pi periodic. We know that the arbitrary complex number z is given as x plus iota times y. So we can say the complex number z is e to the excuse me, the complex number e to the z is e to the x plus iota times y. Now basically, if the complex number is twice pi periodic, if we add twice pi to z, we should still get z. And this is what I've shown explicitly at the bottom center of your screen. And we see that the complex number e to the z is in fact twice pi periodic. And we come to the final thing I'd like to talk about, and this is known as Euler's identity. Recall as we saw earlier on that e to the plus minus i times pi is simply minus one. And this hints at if we, what if we add one to this, we'll get zero. And that is known as Euler's identity, which is given here. Well, that is one of the most special identities in mathematics. It has so many of the fundamental elements that you would use, such as e, pi, iota, the number one, and zero. Okay, that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Please pass it to your friends and consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you.